Well, I'd like to have another prayer, so you'll just join me, won't you, as we bow our heads again. Heavenly Father, we want to know you better. We want to experience a deeper and a closer walk with Jesus. That's my request every day for myself. And I ask that on behalf of everyone here. And I ask that you would, through your Holy Spirit, give us these spiritual eyes that we must have in order to see you as friend, in addition to Savior. Um, give us an anointing and press back the, the, the evil angels so that there be nothing that would distract us from looking in your direction just now. For I pray this in your name, Lord Jesus, amen. If you were here for the first service on Sabbath, I told a story, which I'm not going to repeat in its entirety, about my father who was suffering with bleeding ulcers at the age of approximately 30. I figured it out uh, this morning, and uh, it was um, 50 years ago. And um, he was suffering with bleeding ulcers because even though he was a pastor, he didn't know Jesus for himself. He wanted to have a meaningful relationship with Jesus. I received an email from somebody which I had intended to respond to this morning and time got away as we had other appointments. I'm going to try and respond to it this evening after the meeting. But the email was from somebody who was coming to these meetings and they were saying, I have been a faithful member of the church for pretty much my entire life, but I am still not experiencing the kind of meaningful relationship you described. And I would love to have that. My dad wasn't describing it, experiencing it either. And it was giving him bleeding ulcers. As a result, he was on the verge of resigning from the ministry, resigning from the Seventh-day Adventist church, resigning from Christianity, period. He had sat down to write a letter of resignation to the conference president. And um, something prompted him to read the Steps to Christ, the book Steps to Christ, looking for what it would tell him to do in order to really be a Christian on an ongoing basis. What did he need to do? Not just um, know, but do. And he found that there were a lot of vague and uncertain terms that he couldn't put a handle on, but there were three things in particular when he read it through a second time, three things in particular that jumped off of the pages. He underlined them in red as he went through the book. It was sort of like these concepts that kept popping up through the, through the book. There was an overarching concept, which is what Margie just referred to a minute ago, and that was relationship. She said this was going to be representing our relationship stool. And as she mentioned, there are three legs for this stool. He understood that God was looking for a personal relationship with us, an intimate relationship with us. And as he read in this overarching uh, understanding that he was ga ga grasping, he understood that the ingredients for the relationship consisted of, and this is what I didn't tell you the other day, um, three things. Bible study for the purpose of getting to know God. That was number one. Now, this is, this is not Bible study in order to say that you have read your lesson seven times. It's not Bible study in order to get an A on the test at school. It's not Bible study so that you can make sure that you have a clearer understanding of the proof text you need to have in order to show someone where they are in error in Scripture. It's Bible study for the purpose of getting to know God. That was leg number one of our stool. The second leg of the stool is prayer for the purpose of communion with God. God. Now, this is different than prayer for 911, like, God, I'm in trouble, get me out of this mess, you know, um, help me find my keys, help me pass that test, please don't let that officer give me a speeding ticket, you know, it's something different than that. Not that God doesn't want to hear from us when we are in need, of course, he says to call on him in time of trouble or in time of need, but this is something be beyond that. This is prayer for the purpose of communion with God. The third leg of that stool that uh, we were talking about tonight is sharing or bubbling over with others and uh, expressing to them things that you are discovering as you spend time with the first two legs. So you have something to say because of the meaningful experience that you're beginning to have with, with the prayer and the Bible study for the purpose of relationship building. Now, um, 
one of the things that happened with my dad, if you were here for the second service yesterday, you heard me describe my own personal experience where a click came. I was trying to talk about the need for conversion based on what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He said, you're never going to really fall in love with him. You're never really going to have a meaningful relationship, a heart-stirring relationship, if you um, don't have the click of conversion. And uh, I described that experience for me and how some people had been praying for me and I went to a place where Jesus was being lifted up and focused on. And quite unexpectedly to me, I experienced that click. And I'll never forget that night. That was a transformational night for me. And I, it was a Friday night. And I, I went from finding the Bible boring, boring, boring to not, not being able to put it down. It was just that quick. 24-hour period, 12-hour period. It just went. Whoosh. And um, I, remember, I remember learning that night for the first time where it really kind of like sunk into me that Christianity is not about what you do, it's about who you know, and then who you know changes what you do. Well, um, for me, it was quick. I mean, it wasn't quick in a sense because I was almost 19 years old. But when it happened, it was quick. But it wasn't that way for my dad. And it's important for me to make the distinction here because everybody doesn't have this click happen overnight. What happened to my dad, he described it to me this way. He said, Lee, he said, once I learned that the relationship was the thing that was waiting for me to experience and that those three legs of that stool were the only means that I had for getting to know God, Bible study for the purpose of meeting Jesus, communion, prayer for communion, and sharing with others. He said, I, I said, okay, I'm going to work the three legs of that stool. I desperately want to have something more meaningful when it comes to this relationship that I haven't been experiencing. I want that, and so I'm going to work the three legs of that stool. He said, before I started working on, now he's a pastor, right? He said, before I started working on the three legs of that stool, for me, the Bible was boring, boring, boring. The pastor, and he says, boring, boring, boring. He said, I began reading the Bible with a prayer that God would meet me there and turn something around inside of me. He said, I read for days, and the Bible went from being boring, boring, boring to being boring, boring. He said, I read for weeks, and it went from boring, boring to boring. But he kept reading. He said, I kept reading because I was desperate. I remembered Jacob at the brook Jabbok and how he thought he was wrestling with a foe. And actually it was a friend and he finds out before the night is over that it's Jesus. And you remember what he said? He clung to Jesus and he said, I won't turn loose of you unless you bless me. And dad said, I told the Lord, I don't know anything else. There is no other alternative. If I can't come through with you, if you won't come through with me, I have nowhere else to turn. Nothing else is going to be an alternative that is acceptable. And so I'm going to cling to you, determined to hang on until you bless me. I want this relationship you've described. And then my dad said it this way. He said, Lee, I guess I'd have to tell you that what I did was I white knuckled my way to the click. I don't know if you know what that means. But white knuckle, you know, if, if you were, um, if you're on a roller coaster <laughs> and it has these things like up and down and corkscrews and stuff, the more intense the ride, the more white the knuckles as you hang on because you desperately want to stay, you know, in the, in the cart. My dad desperately wanted to experience a meaningful relationship with Jesus and he just hung on to the three legs of the stool. I am determined. I am going to keep seeking him until he blesses me. And it went from boring to not so bad. And it went from not so bad to okay. And it went from okay to I can't wait to spend time with the Lord again. For my dad, it was like gradients. It was like a rainbow. It blended across from one color to the other side until finally he experienced the click. Now there's two ways. Jesus promised Nicodemus in John 3, the click will happen if you work the three legs of the stool that we're describing for the purpose of relationship with the prayer that Jesus will meet you there. It will happen. Jesus promised it. It's him that put his word on this. He said it's supernatural. It's the Holy Spirit's thing. But it will happen. 
Now, this is really cool. I just, I just love to share this next point. Even if you haven't experienced the kind of heart burning, the kind of warmth that you're wanting to feel as you're seeking to break through into a meaningful relationship, even if you haven't experienced that yet, you're doing the only things humanly possible to grow in knowing Christ. There are no other things you can do. Reading the word of God for the purpose of meeting him there, talking to him in prayer and being willing to share if he gives you something that's gonna bubble over. There's nothing else you can do. You know, those are the relationship components. And those are the relationship components that we have for everybody, getting to know anybody. So if you're doing those three things, even if you're at the rudimentary level, even if you're at an entry level, even if at the moment for you, you're still hanging on and maybe your knuckles are starting to get white, even then, this is the cool thing. You have a relationship with Jesus that is as genuine and real as you're capable of at that moment. You have it. You, You can't improve on that, but he can improve on it if you keep hanging in there. Well, if you have a relationship with Jesus, even if you haven't felt yet that heartburning experience, then 1 John 5, 11 and 12 is for you. He who has the Son has eternal life. That was something we came to last night in the final meeting yesterday. He who has the Son has eternal life. So even as my father was white knuckling and it wasn't yet, it was going from boring, boring, boring to boring, you know, and so on. During the gradient, during the, during the journey from here to here, he had the only kind of relationship he was capable of having and the entire time he was in a saving relationship with Jesus even though he hadn't reached that spot where he couldn't wait over here. Jesus promises to bring us to the click if we'll keep lifting him up. But in the meantime, while we're lifting him up, And looking with that prayer, in the meantime, we have assurance of salvation. That ought to be worth something, huh? Yeah, that's good for something. You know, I'm going to live forever. That's worth tying to. But it gets better than that. Because he promises to take us to the click if we'll keep looking. Now tonight, those relationship ingredients that we just put up on the the screen, um, we're looking at the first one. The first leg of the stool Bible study for the purpose of knowing God. And we want to unpack that. Um, Tomorrow night will be the prayer for the purpose of communion. You know, it's interesting to me when I think about prayer. Most of us have kind of grown up with this idea that you say your prayers. You know, that's a line we even use. You know, kids are getting ready to go to bed and you say, hey, did you say your prayers? Or let's stop and say our prayers before we go to bed. Think about the word say. To say your prayers implies that you sort of get it off your chest and then you go to bed. It's like you give a monologue Then you say amen at the end of the monologue and then you go off. Now, if prayer is for communion, that implies two-way conversation, doesn't it? Communion with God. That's two-way conversation. Now, is it possible that we have missed something that God has in mind for us in terms of communion because we have sort of stalled out on just saying our prayers? And tomorrow night we're going to talk about at least seven ways that you can learn to hear God speaking back so that prayer becomes more and more communion. That'll be tomorrow night. And the third night we'll talk again about the third leg of the stool. But tonight, prayer, excuse me, Bible study for the purpose of knowing God. What we're really describing here are the components for, the, uh, for, for a personal relationship. Uh, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And uh, he said, whoever comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst I am the bread of life can you imagine trying to um, run a bakery without flour can you imagine trying to run a dairy farm without cows can you imagine trying to run a bank without money Well, I guess that's the American way. (laughs) Can you imagine going skydiving without a chute? In each of those cases that I just described, the most fundamental element was missing, right? You can't run a bakery without flour. You can't have a dairy farm without cows. Well, what flour is... 
to the bakery. What cows are to the dairy farm, the daily devotional life is to the Christian. We sometimes call it quiet time with God. Some people call it prime time with God. Some people call it devotional life. Whatever you call it, you can't be a growing Christian without this component. It's just, it's like trying to run a dairy farm without cows. Now, you might be interested to know that surveys taken in churches, in parochial schools, at camp meetings, at retreats, at conferences, across the country, in Seventh-day Adventists, within, within our denominational circles, and within pretty much every other denominational circle that you want to talk about, they always come up with the same statistic. Of the people who sit in a typical church pew, by their own surveyed response, three out of four or four out of five describe their spiritual life as faithfully and regularly attending church but having no daily quiet time alone with God. So 70 to 80 percent of a typical congregation are endeavoring to live the Christian life without really experiencing a meaningful quiet time with God day by day, morning by morning. So what that's doing is it's like trying to run a dairy farm without cows. So uh, Jesus said he was the bread of life and this, this evening I want to give you a spiritual recipe for bread. A recipe for bread. And here's the recipe on the screen. Time alone at the beginning of every day in contemplation of the life of Christ through his word and through prayer. I'll say it again. Time alone at the beginning of every day in contemplation of the life of Christ through his word and through prayer. We're going to unpack that recipe in just a moment, but before we do, just a word about recipes. I'm not much of a cook, but every once in a while I do try to do something in the kitchen. And when I do... I'm the kind of person that I get out a book and I look up the recipe and I set the book down on the counter and if the book calls for a half a cup of this, I get a half a cup. I take a spoon or a knife or whatever it is and I scrape off the top and I put that half a cup in. You know, if it says preheat the oven to whatever, 400, 20 minutes in advance, I set the timer 20 minutes in advance, I push that button, I turn it on to 400. If it says to add a teaspoon of this or a tablespoon of that, I measure and I scrape it off and I put it in and I put all the ingredients in the way it says and then it says to put it in the oven and let it bake for 17 to 21 minutes and then it says, you know, two thirds of the way through that time, open the oven door, put in a toothpick, pull it out, see what comes off and, if, you know, and it gives you the instructions, I follow the instructions. And when I get done, sometimes it tastes okay. (laughs) On the other hand, Margie, she'll get that recipe book out and then she'll say, oh, it wants some of this and some of that. And some of this and some of that. And, you know, I think it would be better if I added some of this too. It's not in the recipe, but let's put it in there and... Wow, and if I was going to add that to it, that would be even an extra special flavor if I put some of this in, too. Not in the recipe. Mix it up. Add whatever, you know, other things she thinks might make it good and pops it in. Don't see her setting the thing to preheat just all perfectly and don't, don't see her pulling the toothpick out of the, out of the item. And, and this is the frustrating thing. When she pulls it out, it tastes better than what I put in. When I, you know, and, um, but I can't bring myself to try and cook that way. The point of that illustration is this. While we put that recipe up on the screen and we're going to unpack it, I want to acknowledge and recognize that all of us are going to approach this a little differently. We're all unique. We're all different. So, you know, as I describe the things I'm going to describe, I don't want you to feel like I'm saying these things are in cement. These are in concrete. You must do it this way. On the other hand, if you're going to bake bread, you're going to have to use flour. Whether you measure the way I do or whether you measure the way Margie does, you're going to have to use flour. So there are certain components that are going to be involved in the baking regardless, you know, of how each person is different. Are you with me there? So having said that, let's take a look once again at this recipe, time alone at the beginning of every day in contemplation of the life of Christ through his word and through prayer. 
let's take a look at prayer first of all. As I begin my quiet time alone with Jesus, and I've been doing this every morning for as long as I can remember since being a Christian, I pray for three things in particular. The first thing I pray for is an increased sense of appreciation for Jesus. That's the first thing I pray for. Because I'm reading for relationship. Remember, this is the relationship stool. I want to have my heart stirred with fresh love and appreciation for Jesus. So I asked for that. Do you remember when um, Andrew and John went to find Jesus? John the Baptist said, you know, behold. And then Andrew and John, they went after Jesus and they said, Rabbi, where do you live? And Jesus said, well, how about coming and hanging out with me for the day? And so they spent the day with Jesus. And after they spent the day with Jesus, they couldn't wait to tell their brothers and they took off running and they come up with bated breath they come to Peter and they say we found the Messiah man we hung out with him all day you wouldn't believe the stuff this guy has to say it is so awesome all right they had a heart burning experience and that's what I want and so I ask for that in prayer every morning the second thing that I ask for in prayer every morning is I ask that God will rebuke Satan's power to distract me You know, there's one thing, just one thing the devil doesn't want you doing, and that's getting to know Jesus better day by day. He's happy to let you do all kinds of other things, good or bad, but he doesn't want you getting closer to Jesus morning by morning. And so what I've discovered is when I sit down to read about Jesus with the prayer that he'll show himself to me that morning, the devil instantly seems to want to release rabbits. And I seem like I'm a hound dog, that just I'm a rabbit dog. And I go off after those rabbits. And I'll open up my Bible to read. And I get down two or three verses. And then I think to myself, oh wow, yesterday the weather report for today was it's supposed to get over 100. I haven't mowed the lawn yet. I'm going to need to mow the lawn before it gets too hot or I might get heat stroke. Oh wow, and I forgot the last time I mowed the lawn, the carburetor needed to be re- rebuilt or overhauled. And I didn't take care of that yet. And so I'm going to have to get a rebuild kit. And all of a sudden I go, oh wait a minute, I was reading about Jesus. Now how did I get on the lawn and rebuilding my carburetor? It's because I chased the devil's rabbit. Vroom. He has all kinds of rabbits. He releases herds of rabbits. He releases flocks of rabbits. He releases prides of rabbits. He releases schools of rabbits. He re- whatever the word for rabbits, he releases them. <laughs> and he hopes you'll chase them. Maybe a rabbit is simply a child. You're a mom. You're a young mom. And, and just as you sit down to have your quiet time with Jesus, that little baby that's been sleeping so peacefully suddenly stirs and begins calling, calling for your attention. Could be a rabbit. So I pray. I ask God to rebuke Satan's power to distract me in any way, shape, or form. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed, don't tell me later that the word Satan was, was a typographical error. I did that on purpose. Lowercase his name every chance I get. That, that for him, that's like fingernails on a chalkboard. Because you remember how he started the whole sin problem? I will be exalted. Well, every time I get a chance, I lowercase his name. Deal with that, Satan. All right. <laughs> the third thing that I pray for every morning as I begin my quiet time with Jesus is spiritual eyesight. As we've already mentioned yesterday in the talk that he had with Nicodemus, Jesus said, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. This book is encrypted. It's like you have to have the code in order to get it. Have you ever seen those books? Sometimes they're children's, I don't know, playbooks. And they have a picture. And then they lay some red cellophane over the page. And all of a sudden you see things on that page you didn't see before. Well, you have to have spiritual glasses. You have to have these glasses in order to see whatever it is that the Holy Spirit intends for you to get that morning. It's... it's, uh, you got to have the red cellophane. And the only way you're going to get the red cellophane laid over the Word of God is if the Holy Spirit does that for you. So I pray for spiritual eyeglasses or hearing aids. Then the little recipe, it said, Time alone, the beginning of every day, in contemplation of the life of Christ through His Word. Through His Word. Well, through His Word. What are we talking about here? Um couple of things to say about his word read inspired material about Jesus 
The point and the purpose of this quiet time that you're spending is to become better acquainted with him. So go where he is front and center. Now, I believe the whole Bible is inspired. But I believe that there are some places in Scripture where the gold nuggets are on the surface and you don't have to dig quite so deeply for them. Uh, There's four in particular that I'm thinking of. What do you think they might be? The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Start there. Go there with a prayer. Go to where the gold nuggets are on the surface. And then, as you become more and more familiar with Jesus in those places, start looking through the rest of Scripture, and you'll discover that he's hiding behind every word and between every line. You'll find him all through Scripture. But it helps to learn to recognize him in the Gospels first. So go there, read inspired material about Jesus. And one other thing about his word has to do with picking a translation that's readable for you. There are people who think that if it's not the King James, it's not the Bible. Um, where, where we live, near Walla Walla, there was a church that put a billboard out that was out for 10 years along the highway that you passed every time you went into the bigger town. And, and the billboard always had signs on it that said things like this, if it's not the King James, it's not the Bible. There's only one Bible, King James. Well, <clears throat> I believe the King James is a wonderful translation and I have most of the verses that I memorize, I memorize in the King James. Maybe many of you do the same thing. But the point of reading is to get to know Jesus better, so pick a translation or a paraphrase that works for you. It's more readable for you. And don't worry, don't worry about missing out on important truth because God promises in this book that whoever is sincerely seeking him He will guide into all truth. And so if you need to understand something that's not maybe represented as well as it needs to be in the particular paraphrase or or translation you're looking at, no worries, mate. He's going to bring you to the right place to understand what you need to understand in his time and in his way. So pick a translation that works for you. Now, one more thing. I think I've said it enough, but I'm just going to put a finger up with a string around it. The purpose of this reading, remember is to become better acquainted with him. HMS Richard Sr. told a story I thought was so cool. I heard him tell it myself. He said that when he was a younger pastor and he had children at home that were preschool age, he said when he would come home, sometimes he'd be real exhausted. And one particular day, he was uh, extraordinarily tired. And he was thinking, you know, when I get home, my kids are going to want to play with me. They're going to say, oh, daddy's home. Can we ride on your back? Will you swing? Will you chase us? Will we play hide and seek? Can we do whatever? And he's thinking, oh, man, I love my kids, but I just don't think I have any energy tonight. And as he was thinking that thought, he drove past a toy store. And there was a sign in the window that said, puzzles, half price. And all of a sudden, he had this great idea. I'll go in and buy a puzzle for my kids. And when I get home, I'll give it to them. And then I can sit down and relax while they put the puzzle together. So he went in, and do you know what he did? I almost hesitate to tell you because I know how you feel about Elder Richards. He bought his preschool kids a puzzle that was a geographical map of the world. (laughs) He thought, that'll take them for a while. That'll keep them busy. He comes in the door, and of course, they say, Daddy, can you play with us? He said, oh, kids, I'd love to, but I brought you a puzzle. And and they said, oh, goody, can we work on it now? He said, oh, yes, you can. And so they went into the kitchen, and he took the lid off, and he dumped the parts out on the floor. And then he said, now, kids, here's a picture. This is a map of the world. It's called a map of the world that we live on. And he said, when you get it all put together, come out and get me. I'm going to be sitting in the chair in the other room. They said, oh, goody, and they went to work. He went out, and he sat down in that chair, put his feet out, Leaned back, heaved a sigh, and thought to himself, I'm going back to that store tomorrow. (laughs) He sort of dozed off, and then just a few moments later, it seemed to him, they were tugging on his sleeve. Daddy, come see, come see, they said. We finished it. Say it's not so, he said. (laughs) Oh, no, we finished it. Come and see. How could you? Come and see, Daddy. And they drug him into the kitchen, and there on the floor was the puzzle. The whole world, everything, all there. It looked perfect. And he said to them in perplexity, how did you do that, kids? Uh, You didn't know where different parts of the world fit with each other, and how did you do that? And they said these words. They said, Daddy, it was easy. They said, on the back side of that puzzle, there was a face of a man. 
So we put the eyebrows in the right place, put the hair in the right place, put the nose in the right place, put the lips in the right place, put the ears in the right place, put the glasses in the right place. And once we had the whole man together, Lord, well, we just, we just turned it over and the whole world was in place. <laughs> and this is what Richards did with the illustration. I'll never forget it. It was perfect. He said, that's the point of this book. There's a man in it. And if you don't find the man in it, you miss the point. But if you find the man in it, the whole word of God comes together. It comes together around a man. We're looking for a man. You remember Jesus said to a group of church leaders one day, he said, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. You're looking for fundamental truths, you know. But these are they which testify of me and yet you don't come to me that you might find life. So, God wants us to understand this is a love letter. First and foremost, oh yes, he also wants us to have our theology straight and understand important truths. But first and foremost, it is a love letter and it was given for the purpose of building relationship. First and foremost. And so we want to look for the man, the man in it. Well, the little recipe said, time alone at the beginning. Time when? At the beginning. At the beginning of every day. Now, I know Genesis 1-1 is just describing the creation, but it's still, I like that thought as I think about my morning and starting my day. In the beginning, God. In the, I have a friend that says, I try not to talk to people before I first talked with God. I like that. In the beginning, God. Proverbs 8, 17 says it this way. I love them that love me and those that seek me early will find me. Those who seek me early will find me. Now, in John 6, which is the place we started tonight, Jesus compares himself to manna. We'll note it here in John 6, verses 32 to 33. Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, Jesus said. My father is the one who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives his life to the world. So Jesus compared himself to manna when he was using the bread metaphor. He linked it to manna. And I thought to myself, now that's interesting. Because I was thinking... You know, back in Exodus, actually Exodus chapter 16, when God began giving manna to the children of Israel, you recall there were certain guidelines that were given in conjunction with the gathering of the manna. Do you remember that? And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to go to Exodus 16 and look to see if any of the guidelines would have any kind of connection with Jesus if you thought of Jesus as the manna. So I went there, and I'm going to show you something kind of interesting. Here's one of those guidelines, Exodus 16, 21. So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. It melted. One of the things that I've noticed about manna is that it melts. Now, how does that apply to Jesus? Well... If I wait until the day is well underway, manna melts. In fact, it seems like there are more rabbits. The farther into the day, the more the rabbits, right? Now, I'm not saying you don't want to spend time with Jesus on your lunch break. I'm not wanting to tell you that you should only be looking in God's word in the morning. But one thing I'm wanting to start out with, I want to begin my day with God because as I begin in the morning, my mind is, is not as full of the distractions that are bound to come across my path as the day goes on. I mean, if I stop for my lunch hour, I, it's a good thing to open my Bible. But I'm also having a harder time thinking about what I've got to do as soon as I get back from lunch break. And that problem that just arose. And that phone call that just came. And this thing I'm supposed to be responsible for and I haven't got it ready yet. And, and all my mind is chasing after those rabbits. So, in the morning, manna melts as the sun gets hotter and hotter. Um, God sent the manna to give people daily strength. When do you need daily strength? At the beginning, right? Nutritionists and doctors would never tell you to um, only eat one meal a day. But if you were going to eat one meal a day, what meal would they tell you to eat? Breakfast. And they'd say eat a hearty breakfast, wouldn't they? 
Make sure it's a good one. They would counsel you against just eating a granola bar. They would counsel you against one of those instant breakfasts, those carnation drinks, you know. They'd say, ah, don't go there, this instant stuff, you know. If you're going to only eat a little bit, eat a good breakfast. I was in a Christian bookstore a while back and I saw a book that just, it just sort of startled me, quite frankly. This was the title of the book. The Man's One Minute a Day Devotional Bible. And I thought to myself, what's the point? Oh, we know how men are so busy and on the go. Gotta go, gotta go. So we got a Bible for you, boy. You can get your Bible time done in a minute if you use this book. Whoa, excuse me. Well, you'll be hearing from those in just a little while, but not yet. I wondered if the author of that book, The Man's Minute a Day Devotional Bible, also had a book on the man's minute a day healthy marriage and time with your wife. You know, it's like, you know. It, it, the Bible is for relationship, right? A minute a day? Marriage, relationship. A minute a day? So, uh, I don't want to go with this. I want to have a healthy breakfast. Well, but you say, I'm not a morning person. So this thing about morning, man, I need my sleep. Don't talk to me before noon. I'll bite your head off. Well, um, here's a really cool promise in God's word. Isaiah 50 verse 4. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. This is really cool. You want an experiment that will just really stir your heart. You tell, God's more interested in spending time with us than we are in spending time with him. So, you say to the Lord in the evening before you go to bed, you say, Lord, I am determined I want to spend time with you. I want to get up earlier. I want to have some quiet time before the day hits me. Would you please be my alarm clock? Would you wake me up when you think I've had enough rest and we're ready to fellowship? Would you do that for me? That's the promise of Isaiah 50 verse 4. He'll do it. Now just one little word of caution. Um, don't pray that prayer if you're not serious. <laughs> because he might waken you at a time that you wouldn't have chosen. It might not even be light yet. And you might look at your watch and you might say, Have mercy, this is an ungodly hour. But if he's the one who woke you, it's nothing ungodly about it. Nothing ungodly. No, you know, I want to, I want to, here's what I do personally. I tell the Lord before I go to bed at night, I say, I want to get up whenever you want to meet with me. Here's my invitation. Waken me. However, I'm setting my alarm anyway, and I'm going to be getting up at such and such a time whether I've heard from you or not. If you want to wake me earlier than that, be my guest and I'll get up whenever you do. I'll tell you this, for the last 10 years, with that, a plan that I've been using, my alarm goes off probably about 1% of the time. And God always wakens me before that. It's just never, I never get to hear the alarm and that's okay. But uh, he will fulfill his promise I have shared that little challenge or that little idea or whatever that exciting experiment in place after place after place and I have had kids seven and eight years old come and tell me a night or two later in the seminar he woke me up he did I asked him to wake me up so I could have time with Jesus and he did it I've had people in their 90s tell me the same thing every age they'll say Wow, but I've also had a lot of people say, he woke me, but I didn't think he wake me that early. <laughs> then I say to them, well, did you get up and spend time with him? They said, yeah, I did. And I, said, I say to them, did you feel like you missed out on the energy and the strength you needed to have for the day? And they say, nope, didn't miss it at all. Didn't miss it at all. Um, in fact, I like to apply the tithing principle here. This isn't a sermon about tithing. But the people in this room who are returning tithes and offerings are going to understand what I'm going to say next. If you're not returning tithes and offerings, this won't make any sense to you. By the way, do you notice I said returning tithes and offerings? I haven't paid tithe for 30 years. I don't pay. P 
Paying tithe is a duty and an obligation. Returning tithes and offerings is a privilege and an opportunity. It's a big difference between those two words. Anyway, if you're in the custom of returning the tithes and offerings, you have discovered something that only people who do this can attest to. You've discovered that 90% of your income with God's blessing goes farther than 100% of your income without his blessing. You've discovered that. You've discovered that 80% of your income with his blessing goes farther than 100% without it. It's a miracle. You cannot make sense of it. You can't make it work on paper. You can't get a calculator and a piece of paper and a pencil and try to make that thing work. But it is a miracle that God promises to come through. Now, he doesn't necessarily give you more money. Sometimes he does. But he will stretch what you have left in ways that you would never have believed to where at the end of the month it went farther than it would have if you'd had the whole amount to start with. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. It's a wonderful miracle. And I could tell, we could all, we could all tell story after story of how God did something like that repeatedly in our lives. But the point of my little uh, illustration wasn't to go off on the tithe as much as it was to say the same thing works with getting up earlier for Jesus. See, seven hours of sleep with his blessing will give you more energy, more strength, more efficiency, more vitality for the day than eight hours of sleep without his blessing. It's the same way. The very same principle goes to work. Six hours of sleep with his blessing will give you more energy, more strength, more vitality for the day. I can give you a personal testimony right now. Friday night, I woke up at 2 Friday night. That's just two nights ago. And I lay there saying, Paul, please, Lord. I like to go back to sleep. I lay there for, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Couldn't go back to sleep. So I said, all right. If that's what you want me to do, I'm ready. I'll get up and meet with you. And, um, you know, I never did go back to sleep on Sabbath morning. And Margie said to me in the morning, so what time did you get up? I told her. She said, well, I'm going to be praying for you that you don't fall, you know, collapse on the platform before the day's over. God gave me more energy, more strength, more vitality for the day yesterday than I, you know, than if I'd eaten a whole bowl of Wheaties and drank Geritol too, you know. <laughs> it was just a wonderful thing. And I testify, fresh, my fresh experience. He just does that. That's so cool. In fact, there's a scripture here, Isaiah 40. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. In fact, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and they will not be weary. They will walk and they will not faint. By the way, Jesus himself gave us this example of rising early to spend time with the Father. In Mark 1.35, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight... He went out into a solitary place and there prayed. What do you consider a long while before daylight? 9.30, 10 o'clock? <laughs> I think of it before dawn, right? It says that Jesus did this on a regular basis. Now if the Son of God found that he needed to get his spiritual battery charged on a daily basis, who else do you suppose might benefit from rising early enough to have time to get a spiritual charge as well? Us, right? Us. Yes. Well, people say, how much time should you spend? You're talking about this time alone with God. How much time? And right up front, I want to tell you that asking how much time is asking the wrong question. And uh, one of the problems that some people get into is they, they say, okay, so, you know, is it 30 minutes? Is it 60 minutes? Is it 15 minutes? How much time do I need to spend? And then they look at the clock and they try to get their 15 minutes in. They try to get their 30 minutes in. And then they say, got that done. Check that off. Go on now for the rest of the day. Got that covered. But they missed the point, right? Imagine a couple that's having marriage trouble going to a counselor and the counselor says, you know, what you really need is you just haven't been having enough time to communicate with each other. You don't have, you don't have quality time in your life. You just don't have any place for that. So I'm recommending that you make some, carve out some space for some quality time together on a daily basis. 
Now, I can't imagine a woman asking the counselor this question, but I can imagine a man saying, well, well, doc, how much time are you talking about? You know, I mean, like, what's the time? Like, what's the minimum? And suppose, just suppose, just suppose that the counselor said 30 minutes, 30 minutes, minimum of 30 minutes, okay? Can you imagine that husband going home and the next day saying to his wife, all right, honey, the clock's ticking. Let's have some quality time. All right, you go first. And, and, um, and, and my word, this is like, it's, all, it's still 29 minutes and 45 seconds to go. This is going to take forever, you know? Would you have much hope for that marriage? Would you have much hope for that guy? The purpose of spending the time is to nurture the relationship, Right? So if I'm having to watch the clock, okay, got my time with God, done. Then what I've done is I have turned the relationship into another legalistic works trip. We don't need any more of those. We have enough of those already. So it's not about... In fact, I like to use this illustration. Exodus 16, 16. It says, this is another one of those guidelines for the manna. It said, let every man gather it according to each one's needs. What that tells me, a couple things. First of all, nobody can gather manna for anybody else. It's like, you have to go one-on-one with Jesus. Your mother, your father, your cousin, your, you know, your pastor, your teacher, your brother, your sister, they can't get a drink of water for you, they can't eat for you, and they can't seek Jesus for you. You have to go on your own to Jesus, one-on-one. So that's the first thing. But let every man gather according to his need also implies that some people might need more manna than others. And that what one person does isn't necessarily what someone else should be trying to do. And if you try to do what someone else says they're doing, it might end up backfiring on you and turning into a bitter experience. I remember back in 1975 or 76, I was invited to a home to uh, have lunch one day, this family. While we were eating lunch at their table, they had a television going in the next room. And through the, the door from where we were seated, I could see the program. And I had a little bit, it kind of caught my eye. Because what it was, it was a talk show. And it was the Mike Douglas talk show. And he was interviewing a fellow by the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Anyway... Arnold Schwarzenegger was being interviewed because he was a bodybuilder. In fact, he had just recently taken the title for the fifth year in a row, Mr. Universe. And this guy was really strong. I mean, at that time, his his biceps were so large that if he scratched his head, it hit him in the jaw. The poor guy, he just, it was like, it was a real pain for him to be that way. And so he couldn't scratch himself. He had to have other people scratch him for him. Anyway, um... There he was on the Mike Douglas show and Mike Douglas said, Arnold, we'd like to know what kind of a fitness program and a, a, uh, you know, bodybuilding program Mr. Universe does and maybe we could learn a few things from, from it for ourselves. So could you give us some pointers? Well, Arnold went over and he picked up a couple of dumbbells and he said, well, I'll use the dumbbells as an example. And so he said, first thing, Mike, He says, you want to pick weights that work for you. He said, don't try to pick what somebody else is picking. Now he starts doing this as he's talking. He's giving his instructions, and he's going like this. He says, don't try to do what someone else is doing. Find a weight that works for you, and then do it. Now, this particular exercise, and by the way, he was wearing a suit and tie with a vest. He took his coat off, but there he is in a white shirt, long sleeve white shirt, and he's going like this with these dumbbells, and he keeps talking. He said, now, you pick this weight that works for you, and then he says, the important thing is you have a regular routine. You do it on an ongoing basis, day after day, and he said, this particular exercise, you don't want to use your legs or arch your back. You want to stand straight, and you just lift your arm, and then you lift the other one, and he's just talking like this as he's going, and he said, "Um, and if you'll take a weight that works for you, you'll discover that over time, you'll develop more fitness. You'll have more strength. You'll be able to do more repetitions. You'll be able to use more weights, but just start. The important thing is that you start. Well, at that point, Mike Douglas says, okay, Arnold, that's cool. We got that. Now, we all want to know how much does those dumbbells weigh that you're using? And Arnold said, hadn't stopped yet. He said, 
Mike, you must have missed the point. I didn't tell you how much I'm doing on purpose because I don't want people to say, well, I could never do that. And so they're going to get so discouraged, they don't even try. So he said, I didn't tell you. And Mike said, we understood you didn't tell us and we promised we won't get discouraged. We just want to know what Mr. Universe does when he lifts dumbbells. And so Arnold said, each one of them weighs 100 pounds. (laughs) He wasn't even perspiring. It was like he was swatting flies. And I'm going, unreal. Well, at that time, I was really heavily into uh, upper bodybuilding strength, not for looking strong, but for being strong, because I was really interested in rock climbing. I did a lot of serious rock climbing, and so I wanted to be strong enough to keep doing that. And I thought to myself, after eating that lunch, I thought, you know what I'm going to do? After school today, I'm going to go into the weight room. I'm going to see what I can do with dumbbells just for fun. Well, I went into the weight room after school, Nobody was there, just me, which was a good thing, it turned out. (laughs) I said to myself, now Arnold said, pick a weight that works for you. So I'm not a rocket scientist, but I know I can't do what Mr. Universe did, so I'm going to cut it down, I'm going to reduce it. So I put 50 pounds on each of my dumbbells. (laughs) Then I stood up, right? Right? Then he said, you know, lift first with one arm and then with the other. Don't bend your um, legs, don't bend your back. So I lifted with my right arm. (laughs) Then I lifted with my left arm. You want to see it again? (laughs) I said, I guess that weight doesn't work for me. So I put them down and I took off some and, you know, made them a little smaller. And I stood up and I tried again. Oh, that didn't work either. So I put him down. What I discovered was that if I just used the little bars, <laughs> I could do like Arnold, not even perspire. <laughs> the point of the illustration, don't ask how much time should I spend with Jesus. Spend time. And like Arnold said, As you spend the time that works with you and Jesus, Jesus will work with you and he will increase your appetite. He will increase what you uh, find meaningful and quality as you spend time with him. And don't try to do what other people say or that could become sort of a dead end or a backfire. Well, one more guideline from the um, manna that I want to point out is Exodus 16 verse 19. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it until morning. Do you remember what happened if they tried to keep yesterday's manna over till the next day? It bred worms and stank, right? Which is another way of God trying to say to us, remember Jesus said, I'm the manna. Another way of God trying to say to us, yesterday's experience doesn't qualify for today. We all need a fresh relationship with Jesus every day fresh experience every day. Well, how do you eat this bread? Desire of Ages, page 390 says, we should carefully study the Bible, asking God for the aid of the Holy Spirit that we might understand his word. That was part of what I talked about a few minutes ago with those three things we prayed. We should take one verse and concentrate the mind on the task of discovering the thought which God has put in that verse. Notice it said, take a verse. It didn't say necessarily to read a chapter. So we should take a verse and concentrate on finding what God has put in that verse for us. Uh, We should dwell upon the thought until it becomes our own. I want to say a word. I want to say a word about Bible reading plans. Um, I'm all for Bible reading plans. I have a Bible reading plan I'm using right now. But there is a problem with Bible reading plans that you need to be careful about. Don't get sucked into this idea that you're trying to read your Bible in a year and so you've got to lockstep yourself through. And because see what happens. Most of us have this problem that we start out well and we start out strong and then something happens and there's, maybe we get sick or maybe we went off to a vacation and forgot our Bible and maybe whatever it is, we get behind a few days and then all of a sudden we think, oh my word, I'm four days behind. In order to catch up with my reading plan, I'm going to have to read four times as much today just to get caught up and we get so discouraged the, and that we, that we slack off some more. Now we're five days behind. Now we're six days behind. And what has happened is most of us with Bible reading programs end up becoming experts in Genesis. (laughs) 
you know? And then we say, well, maybe I'll give it a better start next year and, you know, give it a better run for the money next year. Friends, it's not about getting through your Bible in a year. It's about meeting Jesus in his word every day. That's what it's about. See, so uh, right now, for example, right now, I'm 36 days behind on my Bible reading program. But no worries, because I'm not trying to get it done in a year. I'm just trying to systematically move through looking for fresh experiences of Jesus day by day. And I've discovered that sometimes the experience that I have with him on this particular chapter is so enriching that I just kind of go back there again the next day and the next day. And, and then maybe I get farther behind. But I'm not caring about that because I'm not trying to get done in a year. I'm just trying to meet Jesus every day. So, you know, use your Bible programs, sure, but just don't be a slave to them. Don't let them, don't let them become the taskmaster because that would defeat the purpose, right? Desire of ages. By looking constantly to Jesus, this is as we're reading the Bible now. This, is, this was guidelines for reading. By looking constantly to Jesus, we will be strengthened. God will make the most precious revelations to his hungering, thirsting people. They will find that Christ is a personal savior as they feed upon his word, they will find that it is spirit and it is life. See, we're looking for the man in scripture. This is eating the bread, capital B, that comes down from heaven. So we're looking for Jesus. And then this one that many people have memorized. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour every day in contemplation of the life of Christ. Don't get hung up on 60 minutes here. The point of the author, the, the, author, the author's point right here is that it's well for us to spend quality, meaningful time with Jesus on a daily basis. We should take it point by point. We should let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant. Would you like to have more confidence in Jesus? This is how you get it. Our love will be quickened. Would you like to love him more? This is how you get it. And we'll be more deeply imbued or filled with his spirit. Would you like to have more of the indwelling spirit transforming your life? This is how you get it. Now, I want to make some absolutely practical suggestions for this Bible study thing. Perhaps you're using it. If you are, wonderful. If you aren't, let me just recommend this little acronym. We call it SOAP. S-O-A-P. The S stands for scripture. Read the scripture. Read that passage. Like if you're in the gospels, pick a section that's, you know, the, every chapter has subheadings. Like it'll say the feeding of the 5,000, the resurrection of Lazarus, the last supper. Read a section. Read it slowly. Don't be in a hurry. Go through that passage. That's the S for scripture. Then the second letter from the S-O-A-P. The second letter is O. And O stands for observation, which is another way of saying meditate now on what you just read. Let your mind start contemplating it. Put yourself in the picture. Ask yourself, if I was there when that incident took place, if I was the mother who was asking Jesus to please heal my daughter, you know, how would I have felt? What might Jesus have looked like as he responded and told her, well, let's, you know, I'm not supposed to give this bread to the dogs. How would it have seemed to me if I was one of the disciples and I heard Jesus say that? What would I have thought? If I was watching Jesus teach from the boat just offshore, what would it have looked like? Perhaps the sunlight would have been glistening off of the water behind him. Perhaps the breeze would have been blowing his hair. Perhaps there would be seagulls drifting by above the boat. The crowd just pressing down to the edge of the shore to hear him. Try to imagine the scene. And as you, this is what meditation, this is what was being described a few moments ago as meditation. As you do that, the story under the unpacking and anointing of the Holy Spirit will become more and more real for you. It'll just start stepping off the pages and into your heart and into your mind. That's the O. The A, S-O-A-P, application. Ask God to open your eyes to what this passage has to tell you for your life right now. So take it away from being a history lesson. Take it away from just trying to establish fundamental beliefs and proof texts. Take it down to the heart level and ask God to show you what's in this passage for me today, for this week, where I'm at, the needs that I'm struggling with, the challenges that I'm facing. 
And that's one of the coolest things about God's word is it's dynamic and it adapts to every one of us where we are. It's supernatural. It's because of the Holy Spirit's interpreting the passage to us that you could read a passage and I could read the same passage and both of us would find meat in due season for our soul and not necessarily get the same point out of it. Because that's the miracle of the Holy Spirit as he teaches. But ask him, what's the application there for me? And then the P, -P, S-O-A-P, prayer. Pray about what you've just read and ask the Lord to take that application and unpack it throughout the day, throughout the week. Thank him for the picture, the fresh picture that came into your heart, into your mind as you contemplated right then. S-O-A-P. And then throughout the day, Cock an ear in the direction of the Spirit's whispers as he reminds you of that quiet time you had with Christ that morning. Now I said I want to make this as practical as possible and so what I'm going to do next is something that we, we do everywhere. Um, it's it's um, cold turkey. It's unrehearsed. This is not choreographed. It's just we're going to... Del- we're, I want Jesus to show us all that he really can, through his spirit, unpack a passage of scripture for us if we come to him in this manner. And so what I want to do, this will be a condensed version, but I'm just going to say a prayer. We're going to do the SOAP with a passage of scripture right now, and I'm just going to ask Jesus to unpack it for us as we do it. So would you just join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, you you know how, how terrifying this is for me right now. Terrifying because there's... There's a degree of faithlessness in me that worries that I'm going to try and unpack something from Scripture and it's going to go flat. But that's just the devil whispering in my ear. I know. Because your word is strong. Your word is powerful. And I'm asking you, for the sake of every one of us here, and especially for the sake of people who maybe have not yet started experiencing this, I'm asking you to unpack right now a passage of Scripture. Speak to our hearts. Give us a fresh appreciation for you. Rebuke Satan's power to distract us and give us spiritual eyesight. For Jesus' sake, amen. I simply took the time to put the verses into the computer, but that's as far as I've gone. Now let's read them. This is the S of soap, Scripture. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? And do you not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. They urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. And they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. We just read it. Now let's do the O, observation. In my mind's eye, I see these two guys walking from Jerusalem and they're probably walking with stooped shoulders and their heads are probably looking, you know, towards the ground. And they're probably not talking with very much enthusiasm or energy. They're broken. They're disappointed. They're sad. 
They're saying to one another, I thought he was the one. I really thought we were going to go places with him. I really thought we were going to see the, the promise fulfilled that the Messiah would come to his people and now, and now he's gone. And not only is he gone, do you, do you, do you remember how it was? Did you see his face as he was walking down the Via Dolorosa, as he was dragging that cross, did you see the blood dropping onto the cobblestones? Did you see and hear the people shouting at him? Not only is he gone, but he went in such a painful way. And they're so sad, and their hearts are broken, and they're probably weeping as they walk. And then it says that suddenly Jesus joined them on the road. And their tears perhaps, mist over their eyes such that they don't even recognize who he is. And he says, so what are you guys talking about? And they say to him, oh man, don't you know anything? Huh. How could anybody not know what just went down this weekend? Jesus of Nazareth. I'm telling you, Jesus of Nazareth. They killed him. They killed him and we thought he was the one. And then Jesus starts as they're walking and he's stepping over the same stones that they are and pausing to rest when they get tired after going up a switchback and then joining them again as they continue. And he says to them, let me tell you something. I've been thinking about that stuff in the Old Testament about the Messiah, you know? And it says he started showing them all of the things in Scripture concerning himself. He wanted them to see the man of the Old Testament. I want him to see that. Oh, there he is there. Oh, here he is here. Oh, look, he's peeking out from behind that phrase. Oh, look, at, he's peeking out from behind this illustration. Oh, look at over here. Here he is here. Here he is here. Here he is here. And they lose track of time. The seven miles just goes. Because they're just like dumbfounded. They've never seen Jesus in Scripture before. And now Jesus is showing them Jesus in Scripture. I guess he'd know where to look. And he's looking and he's talking. And they're going, oh, amazing. Whoa, that's incredible. Oh, look, we're at our house. Oh, my. It looks like it's getting late. Look, why don't you come in and eat with us? And he says, sure. Because he always goes where he's invited. And he comes in. And they sit down. They say, here, here's some food. And man, hey, you know, this has been such a wonderful conversation. We've just really enjoyed this would, would you ask the blessing on the meal and Jesus goes to ask the blessing and then vanishes and what do they do they go <laughs> it's the Lord whoa they go duh I mean I'm telling you didn't your heart burn within you as he talked with us along the way it had to be him how could we have missed it he's alive he's alive who cares about the soup? Who cares about the dark? Who cares about seven miles? We got to tell somebody. And they burst through the door and they run all the way seven miles back to Jerusalem. And as they're running, they trip and they fall and they get lost and they leave the path. And in the dark, they get lost again, but they keep scrambling around. Maybe they've skinned up their knees and skinned up their hands, but they race and they finally knock on the door and, they, and, the, and the disciples on the other side, they say, oh, what's the password? <laughs> what's the password? J-E-S-U. S. Jesus is alive and kicking, man. We walked with him for seven miles. And they open the door. And you know what? In just a few more minutes, there he is again. Jesus. Where's the application? There's the O oh, observation. We tried to meditate. We tried to put ourselves in the picture. We tried to ask God to make the story come alive for us. Now, what's the A of soap? Application. Well, here's the application for Lee Venden. I want Jesus to keep showing me every day fresh glimpses of himself in his word. I want my heart to burn within me morning by morning as he goes, hey, look, here I am again. <laughs> here I am again, Lee. Bet you never saw me here before. Check that one out. Whoa. And over here. And let me show you something. This relates to this <laughs> I'm over here too see look at that what do you think of that and I'm going Jesus it really is all about you isn't it it really is 
all about you. Thanks for giving me a love letter that reminds me that you're the man, you're the one, and you will meet with me and teach me along the way. That's my application for Lee Vinden right now. And now let's do the P. Let's have the prayer. Lord Jesus, I want to meet with you again every day. And I want everybody here to have the taste of fresh bread. I want us to smell the oven, as the, the bread in the oven as it, as, it, as it bakes. I want us to be attracted to the odor and open up the word. And I want to meet you. And I want that experience for everybody here. Uh, including the woman who sent me an email and said, I haven't really tasted the bread yet. I'd like to. Lord Jesus, give her a taste tomorrow morning. Give every one of us a fresh taste for your name's sake. So, Lord Jesus, there's a bunch of us here who want to taste and see. For some, it'll be tasting again because that's been something that we've been doing on a regular basis. But for others, Lord... They're going to try tasting and seeing for the first time tomorrow morning. Whether they um, do like my dad and kind of white-knuckle their way along with this relationship or, or whether you just surprise them with a wow and there you are and their heart starts burning within them. Either way, Lord Jesus, give them the sense that you still meet with people along the way. You still reveal yourself you still show us glimpses of your love and that you still pull us in with your strong carpenter's arm and embrace us and then give us a little nudge as we move out into the day with a promise that you're going to go with us whatever befalls us you'll never leave us or forsake us so teach us lord to find you in your word morning by morning day by day until one day we find you in the clouds and recognize you because we've become so familiar with you now that we know who you are when you come, our best friend. I pray this in your name. Amen.